So I wanted to start tonight by uh, going into a little bit more detail about the four characters that uh, appear in the game, as they've been also appearing in most of my uh, artistic production in the past five years. Um, they're almost like friends now. The first one, this guy on the screen here, is uh, Douglas Botter, who is an extremely decorated Royal Air Force fighter pilot. Um, he joined the Royal Air Force around 1928, so between the wars, and shortly thereafter uh, was at an air show that he wasn't even meant to fly in, and people kind of goaded him into taking the plane up to do some acrobatics. Um, and he crashed the plane and lost both his legs to a double amputation. There was no real uh, rules about that for in the military uh, for pilots having no legs at the time, but when World War II came around, he was made an exception and allowed to re-enlist. Uh, he went on to be an extremely uh, potent uh, fighter pilot throughout the whole thing, and he was also very famous for uh, quite an effusive and uh, bombastic personality. Uh, next guy we're going to talk about is Ottavio Botecchia. Uh, this is the cyclist in the game. He was the first Italian to win the Tour de France. Uh, pretty simple guy from a poor farming village. Uh, he was known as a man of pretty much very few words. It was said that when he arrived in France for the Tour de France the first time, the only words he could manage were no bananas, lots of coffee, thank you. The little bit of reading he was able to do, they say, was self-taught and by way of illicit anti-fascist literature, even though much to his discomfort, Mussolini was a great admirer of his. In 1924, he won the Tour de France, so again, the first Italian to do so. He won it end to end, and the big sort of first controversy was with him was when the tour was a approaching the stage that would have ran across along the Italian border uh, from Toulon to Nice. He refused to wear the yellow jersey. That was his right as the leader of the race um, for the entire thing. Um, he just didn't put it on. And uh, an enormous amount of chatter kind of sprung up, like why he wouldn't really explain himself. Like I said, he was a man of few words. Um, and he did end up putting it back on for the stage that ran along the Italian border. But it was uh, a mystery and kind of a, a very gossipy uh, site of speculation for many years to come. And then a few years later, he was found dead by the roadside in his hometown with his head kind of cracked open, murdered pretty viciously, and it was never solved, the crime. Next up, we have Barb Nicole Ponsardin. Sorry for my French. Um, she is a widow, a very famous one. We know her as Madame Clicquot. She was the founder of Veuve Clicquot. The word means widow, I didn't know that. Um, her husband died when she was really young, around 23, and she convinced her father-in-law to let her take over the wine production aspect of the estate. Um, given the times, it was mostly because it was a very small part of the estate, and the wine of that region at the time was not particularly well regarded. Um, but she took it on with gusto and with her cellar master developed the techniques by which we make champagne still to this day. Um, what she figured out was, and they invented a sort of table for this, is that they could ferment the wine in the bottle, thus producing a natural carbonation. And as they did so, they would have them in racks at a 45 degree angle. So all the yeast and, and uh, sugars or whatever it's called, the lees, would settle into the neck of the bottle and then could be removed basically through the pressure existing. Now they have more complicated and, and more violent ways of doing it. They kind of flash freeze the neck with liquid nitrogen and this amazing kind of like dagger machine kind of goes in and plucks the ice cubes out. It's a, it's a real Duchampian bachelor machine almost. Um, but she was also, you know, it was, it's also no accident that the, the image of champagne is a celebratory drink. She was very, very savvy, and uh, it, was, it was no coincidence that it became a, the favorite celebration of Napoleonic soldiers who would open it with the back of their sabers in a very dramatic fashion. The fourth figure that we know from the game is Katie, an actress. Um, I don't... She's a sort of shapeshifter in a way, as the introduction to the project tells you, and her section of the game is also a little confusing. I think 
rather than explain her, I think she'll come up again naturally as we move through things. And I want to get into talking a bit about the bigger picture of my exhibition history with these four characters and the first time I worked with uh, interactive fiction. My work in the past five years or so has been about portraiture, but in a somewhat indirect way. Um, I became interested with these four figures as my test subjects in a sort of negative portraiture or a portraiture of absence in which the figures being portrayed never appear, but sort of a, a kind of perimeter or horizon or limit is created, a negative space out of which their impression could still emerge. Suspended portraits made by objects, stand-ins, implied narratives, patterns. Um, I'd like to read a quote by Rene Dumal, uh, a great pataphysician, I guess, and surrealist who's on the screen right now. I sort of adapted this over time in my head to understand the way I wanted to approach this kind of portraiture. What is a hole? A clown asked his partner in a ring at the Circus Medrano. Having thus quite confused the fellow, he wasted no time in lording it over him. A hole, he said, is an absence surrounded by presence. A ghost is indeed a hole, but a hole to which are attributed intentions, a sensibility, morals, a hole that is, an absence, but the absence of someone and not of something, surrounded by presence, by the presence of one or several. A ghost is an absent being amidst present beings, and it is the pierced substance that determines the shape of the whole, and not the absence which that presence surrounds. For it's only in jest that some tell of canons of bygone days that foundry workers bane by taking holes and pouring bronze around them. When we endow ghosts with intentions, a sensibility, and morals, these attributes reside not in the absent beings, but in the present ones that surround the ghosts. And that's by Rene Domal from a short essay called The Pataphysics of Ghosts. So I set out to making holes in this way through a series of shows. The results were often rather mute unto themselves, yet somehow carried all this information with them. And I was trying to figure out how to negotiate that gap. I didn't want to just close the gap, but rather see it as an elastic space between these kind of quiet, muted objects and all this information about these characters that we just went through briefly. I wanted to see it as a space that was capable of being operated on and in, capable of multiple states of viscosity from thick and impenetrable to thin and runny. Taking the information as having states of fully encrypted and fully promiscuous, and taking as part of my task for this project to modulate these viscosities across different venues and media. I'd also been thinking about writing and art in a more general sense and was looking for a way to maybe not write in a way that precedes an art object like a press release might or or follows an art object the way a critical essay or a review might, but something that could be more active and, and write through the object or around the object. I wanted to implicate writing, reading, and the viewer all at once somehow. So why interactive fiction in particular for this? Um, I've always had a strong interest in playing and thinking about video games. But probably the reason I came back to these text-only adventures and the more experimental articulations of them that came out in the 90s around the release of Inform, which is the software that I used to make this program for Triple Canopy, I was actually thinking less about games and more about the command line. Um, there's a book by Neil Stevenson that I was reading at the time um, called In the Beginning Was the Command Line. And he argues that the graphical interface distances us further and further from understanding the workings of computers compared to a command line like MS-DOS, which even to him was a sort of already a rather mediated uh, way of interacting with the computer. His point was basically that the more graphical the interfaces get, the easy they are, easier they are to tell the computer what to do, the more intuitive they are, but the less we actually know what we're telling it to do. And this was in 1999, so I can't imagine what he would have to say about the sort of touch screens and uh, really icon-driven mobile operating systems that we use today. So right away from the start, I was thinking about a situation where operating an exhibition from this text-based interface was going to give someone more access and understanding to what the works themselves encoded. I thought interactive fiction could be like a hack into the aggregate of info, research, narrative, in terms of both facts and fictions that behind the work. 
This was my way of somewhat invisibly maybe um, questioning the roles of visual culture versus written culture according to terms of agency and power. I do think there's a political dimension to this command line argument. It's really easily extrapolated. I think we see exponentially more and more images all the time, um, but it doesn't necessarily lead to more agency or emancipatory potential. Not proportionally, anyhow. I mean, you can definitely think of ways in which that's true, but usually in a dissentered way. And meanwhile, like Peter quoted from the intro, I think uh, the central power, a more traditional central power, is very much still consolidated by writing, if you take writing in a more expanded sense, whether that's, as he mentioned, the uh, you know, literally programming intellectual property or legislating to protect it or hacking to get around that or news, you know, even news is interesting because there was a sort of very visual period where the televisual had its heyday, but post-internet we see we're writing and reading all the time. All that information comes much more in written form again. But it seemed to me, and maybe to a less extent now, that we should be wary somewhat of the kind of palliative potential of this endless stream of images and more observant of the kind of power that writing can unlock. So with that in mind, I approached the first game, which I actually made for an exhibition at Ford, a space called Ford in Geneva in 2011. Um, this was the first appearance of all four characters at once. Uh, they had appeared in a few other projects before, um, but more loosely and not as structured. As you can see, this is one of the installs. Um, and I thought of the interactive fiction in this case as quite literally an operating system for the exhibition. Uh, the exhibition was arranged and according to a logic of suites, uh, one wall per character and sort of three works for each character, um, quite rhetorically displayed as you can see here. And there was always a floating head portrait and there was a sort of portraiture of objects which consisted of uh, a identically dimensioned pedestal that was injured in a different way each time and personal effects or objects of the of the characters, and then a sort of chair and a tapestry, which was kind of the, the theatrical portraiture, the site at which this figure might arrive, but of course never did. Katie, our mysterious Katie, was actually kind of separated off to the side in a, in a different room behind a curtain. Um, I think, you know, when I brought them all together, I started to see a sort of positive connection through them in that they all had this in common a sort of uh, history of separation or the cut. There's the amputations in the, in the pilot. There's the separation of the jersey from the cyclist and eventually his head and the widow separated from her husband and finding this kind of decapitation of champagne. Um, but also more troubling was that they were all kind of historical figures that I didn't really intend to biographize or bi make biographies out of per se as much as use them as kind of figures or triggers for these experiments in portraiture. So I wanted her to be a sort of separate, separation in project, progress and a, a kind of fully speculative fiction. So I started narrativizing around this American actress who was married to another actor who's very famous and kind of drawn into a sort of science fiction-y religion. Um, yeah, Katie. And then in the middle of the room, with all these sort of new space in the center because the objects had an interesting kind of uh, centrifugal force. They kind of pushed everything, they pushed themselves back against the wall. Um, and in the center was this terminal, uh, kind of cold and imposing, but uh, that was the, the, oper the very first interactive fiction I made. The game was kind of structured into three tiers or access levels, you might say. So tier one was a, a sort of raw description machine. And you know, when you sat down, if you sat down at the terminal, the room described to you as the room that you're in. So you're being described the exhibition as you could look at it if you looked up. Um, you were described the various works on the walls and you could use kind of standard interactive fiction commands like examine mostly in this phase to look closer and then closer again. So it re revealed these kind of layers and layers of description that um, were maybe more articulated than just looking at first glance. So theoretically, if the writing did its job and the player wrote effectively into the writing, you might see the show without ever looking up from the screen. And having this tier really just meant looking around a lot, but that's usually the first step in playing an interactive fiction anyways. Now, tier two required some interaction with the objects, um, but at this point I was sure I didn't want the game to just kind of describe the exhibition, but also distort it on a level. 
In each suite, when you interact through the game, there was always a sort of hidden message. Um, there were no real puzzles to it. It was kind of revealed on a whim of the player. So for instance, if the, uh, again, this is maybe, a, if you've played a lot of interactive fiction, this is usually like step two, you start being like, okay, let me try and see what's, what's possible here. So if you tried to drink the coffee, for instance, it would reveal that there was a message in the bottom of the cup. Um, if you turned out the hanging light in the room, in Katie's room, there would be a glow from the upside down pedestal and you'd see a sort of message in glow in the dark ink in the bottom. But the thing is, none of these messages are actually in the physical sculpture. So at this point, the game is starting to bend the reality of the objects it purports to describe. I really liked thinking, I mean, kind of fantasizing really about an adventurous user who would be totally emboldened by the rules of the game allowing for this, because again, when you, a lot of time, I mean, interactive fiction can be very, very frustrating. So when you're allowed to do something, it usually feels significant because most everything else just gets blocked. Um, but I was hoping they might transfer this little cheat code, you know, say, okay, if I can do, if I can drink the coffee in the game, then maybe I'm supposed to drink the coffee and in real life. Um, but I don't think that it really worked. Actually, we made the coffee fresh every day just in case, but no one ever actually <laughs> drank it. Um, I think somebody turned the light off there. The light was off a couple of times, but it could have been something else. Um, that was kind of safely more private. So now the third tier of the game is the sort of the end game, so to speak. Things get much more normal as an interactive fiction, but a lot weirder in trying to understand all this as like the terms of a relationship between an exhibition and a viewer. So if the player sits in any of the chairs, in the suites, they actually become the character. So it's the first point in the game where they're not themselves viewing the exhibition, just like they are in real life. So they, they start being the figures, the characters, these objects of suspended portraiture. And it's also where the puzzles come out. So there's a point where you have to figure out to turn the champagne four times before you can remove it from the rack. And then the cork is stuck. So you have to go upstairs and find a knife to open the thing. So very kind of standard, pretty basic interactive fiction puzzles. Um, but I think what I'd like to go back here to, to here is the idea of the cut and separation that ran through the four characters. Um, because here the player, in a way, gets their own cut. Uh, in sitting down to the private space of the game, they cut themselves off from the exhibition proper. They cut themselves out of it. Um, but they're also simultaneously cut into the exhibition, not as a viewer, but as the player, since for anyone else in the room, they are now part of the tableau, performing as the player. Um, for those moments, they're excluding one mode of engaging, the standard viewing, to include themselves into another. They're at the same time excluding anyone else from playing that role, but in turn get included in that person's view of the exhibition. So it, got, it gets complicated. But I think, uh, you know, writing in a way always faces this dilemma of inclusion versus exclusion. And a cut as such uh, always has to be made in one way or another. Um, this played out for us in the conversations we had about whether the show would be better served by a more passive delivery system, uh, like a video or a game playing itself, a sort of player piano version of the game animated, or maybe some form of printed matter in the form of transcripts. But uh, no matter what, we had to make a cut. If we did a self-playing video, this fantasy super user who comes in and never looks up, beats the game, and walks away with all this information would be excluded. If we put the game in its true form, it excludes people who were many. Uh, who might not feel comfortable sitting down and playing with the intimidating form or, or even just basically transgressing the kind of rules of engagement in an exhibition, you know, it wasn't fully clear that you, it was even a sculpture to be touched at all times. In the end, we chose the hard mode. Um, the game was just there, it was imposing, and since it was my first, it was also pretty badly programmed, so the people who did try probably ran into problems <laughs> as well. Um, and I'm pretty sure from the transcripts that we, the, this sort of super user, never looking, just interacting with the sculptures only when the game revealed a shift in permissions to her, like the coffee or the light, um, embracing the role of player and performer in an impossible leap from the computer chair to the waiting chair in the suites. That user, uh, she never arrived as far as we know. Um, and I'm not sure I regret it, but the Triple Canopy Project was definitely focused on making some of that right, literally and conceptually. So a quick gloss over, I mean, in between the launch of you, 
can't see any such thing, the Triple Canopy Project, and this show, which was in 2011, I did a series of uh, three solo shows that basically expanded on the logic of the suites, uh, but focused on a single character per show. So this was the first of three shows. This one was focused entirely on the widow. Um, the object, the, the tapestries, the patterns became paintings, and the objects sort of took on specific roles in each one. Um, a sort of series of poisonous plants that I grew in the studio here that kind of both shaped space in a way and lent a kind of ambient threat to the room. The cyclist here, that red pattern is actually derived from the stage of the Tour de France where he wouldn't wear the jersey and the bouquet in the far corner was uh, recreated by a florist based on the images of him winning the Tour de France. So there was a sort of forensics involved in this show. And then for the pilot, it was much more personal. The scarf that he was very famous for wearing um, and objects related to him very personally, it was almost like more personal effects. Um, and there was a kind of thread of romance that ran through them. So when this piece, You Can't See Any Such Thing, was first commissioned, a lot of our early conversations were about accessibility. I was interested in working with interactive fiction again, but this time I wanted to make a game that was A, kind of free from any particular exhibition, and B, more accessible or at least less frustrating. I still wanted it to negotiate that gap between the research and information about the characters that's always lurking behind my objects, but since it no longer served the lines of inquiry around an exhibition and how we access it the way the Ford game did, we could take a different tack. So one thing that happened over the course of the single character shows was that more and more fiction started to mix in with the facts about the characters. Um, I was really starting to see the project as a as a speculative fiction project where the biographies of the characters are kind of distorted and mixed up with small minor fictions and errors that are hard to distinguish clearly and especially over time given the relationship of memory to lots of small bits of information it's kind of fluid in terms of what's in our mind in a given second I wanted you can't see any such thing to enable that reading from the shows individually and as a whole so it's not that it's totally decoupled from my art project, but it can live with or without it. It kind of flies over the whole thing rather than hovering over one show. That said, even with this accessibility in mind, we didn't want to just make an easy game. Um, I would have worried that we were dumbing it down for the internet, and that certainly wouldn't fit the Triple Canopy mission statement. <laughs> so I wanted to free the game from the standards of the exhibition, but also somehow complicate the standards of interactive fiction. Um, the tiers I'd like to walk us through with the new game are uh, interaction, description, spatiality, and narrative. So this is actually a map of a very early uh, interactive fiction called Zork. Uh, it's a user-generated map. There's a lot of interesting ones out there because having no visual interface and being very complicated and maze-like, uh, people had a way of kind of tracking their progress through or diagramming the whole thing to share. So it's, it could be a solution or a breadcrumb trail. It could be a lot of different things. But they're very early games in the 70s. Uh, the first, in fact, was by Will Crowther. He was a caver and an ARPANET developer. Um, and it was basically a map of mammoth caves that he made a game to explore through. But all of the games around that time were mostly dungeon crawlers or uh, had this like very kind of maze-like structure. Um, that was one of the things we wanted to move along from. This is an ARPANET logical map that I just wanted to show quickly because you can kind of see, given that these guys were working on and in this thing, that the logic kind of reflects nicely there. But this is the map of our game with Triple Canopy. <laughs> so it's, things got a lot simpler in some ways and, and more you know, complicated in others. Here's another ARPANET image. And this is a more kind of uh, friendly or fun map of Zork. So we start in the center, much like the last game. Um, it's a sort of neutral space at the center of things. And there's really only four rooms proper in this game. You can move in the cardinal directions, north, south, east, west. And when you do so, you move into the region of a given character. Um, if you go north. You assume the figure of a widow, a.k.a. Barb Nicole Clicquot, a.k.a. the Grand Dame of Champagne. 
Um, if you go south, you become the cyclist. Well, not exactly. If you go west, you go the pilot. If you go east, you become Katie. And from here, well, I should speak a little bit about the level of interaction as well, for those of you who haven't played the game. Um, the first thing you might do upon being presented with this room would be to examine things that seem significant. Uh, the bold is kind of a good hint. So if I were to examine 14, we're quickly redirected to use the sense of smell. Um, so this was the sort of next kind of deviation from standard standards was the the way in which you interact with the objects and each character has a sort of dedicated sense um, smell for the widow touch for the pilot in Katie's case you're listening to silences and since examine or seeing is the kind of main basic operation for most interactive fiction, the, the cyclist's part actually starts out with him already dead, and you're a sort of country, a cyclist called in to help some country policemen examine this scene and figure out what's going on. So you use kind of psychic vision to see into things. So now, going quickly back to spatiality, so now when I smell 14, I'm glad that's recording. You get this. So part of the reason I was interested in, in kind of using these sensorial interactions was the kind of language that we could use for the descriptions that come back. Um, the italics here kind of follow the, I was really interested in like fragrance marketing, um, things like that. There's a sort of interest for me in language that has to describe the sensorial, whether a fragrance or the elaborate language built around wine. Um, so I wanted to bring that into the project and give it a sort of wetness. And then it jumps you into the fields. So at this point, you haven't really moved anywhere um, because you can't go north because you're in a fantasy or a memory. So the entire game kind of proceeds through these sensorial interactions that then trigger a memory or a flashback or something in between. And here you can still do stuff that you can sort of continue to smell things. One of the things the widow was famous for saying was that they asked what does champagne taste like and she said it, you taste stars. So if you were to try and taste stars, you get this little bit of found text uh, about astronauts and what they how they described what space smelled like which is of course impossible but they would come back and kind of smell their spacesuit and this would be the, the the things that they described we get out of here we blink and we're back in the boudoir and there's three items for each one and three jump scenes and then you move on here. East, we go to Katie. So you can see now that this supports a pretty unusual approach to narrative. It's very impressionistic, has no real beginning or end or narrative drive. Um, you kind of have to piece together your own story out of it. I was really interested in a section of uh, Riza Negasturani's Cyclonopedia, uh, where he talks about hidden writing, which is a writing that's not whole, but holy. So not whole with a W, but holy, meaning perforated. And the holes in the plot, the plot holes are as constitutive as the plot itself. And in fact, they are the plot, um, a sort of writing of a perforated or degenerate hole. So now all this time we're still wondering how to make the game not uh, annoying when you hit those walls that are so common in interactive fiction, how to recover the mistakes that players, uh, even experts, are inevitably going to make. And this is where the idea for the game's primary mechanic came from and its title. Uh, you can't see any such thing. So when you make a mistake in interactive fiction, you for usually would get a standard response. So if you were to say, try to examine something that isn't there, it will tell you you can't see any such thing. If you try and use a verb it doesn't understand, it'll say that's not a verb I recognize. Um, which is interesting for two reasons. One, 
oftentimes you can't see any such thing. I think it's probably the most common error because if, it, if the person who writes the game forgets to include that in building the sort of little knowledge of the game itself, uh, it, even though it just said you're at a table and there's two computers on it and you examine the computer, it'll say, it'll say you can't see any such thing, which can be extremely frustrating. Um, but also it's the first time that the game, the parser, sort of starts speaking in the first person in this weird way, and you start to feel like there's this kind of third element at play. Um, but let's try to examine water or something. This is Katie, so we have to listen to. You can't see any such thing. And so this here is the kind of main mechanic, and the main thing that sort of took it in the complete opposite direction as the previous game from Ford. These are basically plot holes that get detected at which point a content restore is kind of initiated, or at least you're convinced of that by the sudden change in the typography and uh, the fact that you're suddenly hearing a, quite a different voice. Um, if you we were to go, say, back to the cyclists, or the, I'm sorry, the pilots area, and just kind of mash keys here, it's going to continually kind of find these plot holes, restore content, and rather than the fictions that the game has been providing through these uh, sensorial jump cuts, so to speak, we're going to start getting facts about Douglas Bader. So whereas in the first game, playing the game right, a really difficult task at that, gave it the access to the deep info, the kind of protected info, in the new project, playing it wrong, ideally in a very flagrant fashion, as I'm doing right now, it kind of gives you the fastest access to that, again, aggregate of information that's behind it all. If you play the game according to its rules, you get drawn further into fiction. Play it wrong, and you're rewarded with truth and facts. Again, going back to the idea of the cut, this is the most inclusive cut possible, not only because it's freely available on the internet from anywhere, anytime, but also because that secretly pre that previously secreted away real info, which in the previous game was won only by the most dedicated player, is now given up by doing the easiest thing to do when playing an interactive fiction, namely making a mistake. And for me, that kind of mashing those keys over and over again, that's one of the most pleasurable ways to play the game. But I guess, as we said in the intro, we reach the point of greatest fascination at the moment in which a riddle or fiction threatens to undo itself. It's pretty comfy at the limits of the game. Thank you. <laughs>